thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is just uh, incredible to think that we're here meeting together and doing this. Nobody would have thought this a year ago, right? With all the predictions and things that were happening. So thank you for uh, doing whatever you needed to do to get here and, and moving forward. So it's great to have you here. Um, we did this virtually, virtually, virtually last year, and I just remember in Willard's garage that Amy and I probably uh, drank at least a couple gallons of water apiece. It was quite warm, and those computers in there put off quite a lot of heat. So <laughs> uh, I much rather do it like here, like we're doing. So, and welcome to everyone that's online. Hopefully, you can see this, and the broadcast is coming through. So. This is uh, just an update for a Raptor Resource Project that I'm going to do here. We've got Mom Decor here, who, which, if, you know, it'd be nice to know if we could get into her brain and understand what Eagles were thinking and why they did it. That might not necessarily bring her back here, but um, at least we'd know why, right? This is a beautiful shot of Mom Decor when we were here last year. And it was just like right in the morning when I did the greeting. It's like she's she's welcoming everyone, and I saw I heard that there was an eagle up on the block that might have been DM2 just a little bit ago. But uh, um, welcome everyone. Where's so we got people from Texas, we got people from Maryland, right? Okay, anybody further than that? Michigan, Washington, Vermont, Kansas City. Wow. You guys are dedicated. It's, it's great to have you here. So, uh, and 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 you walked, right? That you get extra credit for walking. So uh, that's one of the things I think that I wanted to mention is just how. The Eagle Cam and the education program just has brought people together. Um, and just everything else that has stemmed from this. Uh, we, we know, we, we, we've seen with the Falcon work that Bob Anderson was really the, the father of the bird cams. Um, it just, there's no disputing that. Uh, with his research that he was doing before broadcasting and then, you know, when the Falcons returned up at the King plant and with Maze Internest and 2003 with the Eagle Cam out at Fort St. Brain. Um, and then now, you know, when when uh, Neil and, and Bob came together to do uh, Eagle, American Eagle, and decided to put the camera up into uh, what we call N1 up uh, at the Holthaus residence. Just amazing to think about what's happened since then. What, 14 years ago now? We start from 2007. Just amazing. Just think of the millions and millions of people that have watched the Eagle Cam. And then, you know, Bob called them copy cams, but everything comes forward, you know, when it's a great idea. We love it that everyone else is doing the same thing. There's so many Eagle Cams out there. There's so many other folks that are doing education and raising awareness and connecting people with nature uh, through these nature cameras. That's really the goal. So. The more that are out there, the better. That's all I can say. Good quality ones, right? The rated G and PG ones. <laughs> we can't stop that. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit worse than that, right? Um, so as the cottonwood sways, we really, really never know what uh, is going to happen with those eagles and what they're thinking. Um, really, this year was, was so crazy in so many ways. And what ended up happening is Mom and DM2 decided to nest at a different nest. And we don't know exactly the reason why they did that, but it's like, I remember back in 2014, 2015, when I'm driving around in a car with Bob, and he's like, we have to have a backup camera, a backup Eagle camera for this program. This program is way too important for us to miss a season like happened in 2012, 2013. So, um, I remember going out and looking at different nests with Bob, and we kind of came to the one that is now the, the Core North Nest. And we might have some visitors tonight, some guests. 
uh, that help us out with that. We'll see if they're able to make it, but uh, uh, that connection with the landowner uh, is, is really critical. Um, so it did what it was supposed to do. We had a backup camera, and it really, I don't, it's almost not fair to call it a backup camera. I know all of the mods at DN, all of you folks who watch the Coronor, it's different and it's unique and it's beautiful uh, Eagle family. And, and over the years, I've got a, uh, a real soft spot in my heart for the for Mr. North now and DNF uh, um, and the young that they've raised there. And just the relationships with the families up there that help us bring this out to all of you. It's just a, it's a great thing to be able to do. So we were able to recover, even though mom and DM2 decided to abandon us. <laughs> um, they couldn't get away from the cameras, and they couldn't get away from the fans, though, right? We had fans. Uh, uh, Sue and Benny Bruling uh, kind of said, hey, we think this might be a place where they're going. And we started doing some research and checking into it. And voila, we found out that by the absence and presence uh, uh, verification that when they were at the hatchery, they were uh, not at N3, and when they're at N3, they were not at the hatchery, and when one would start going in that direction, to drive faster than them, and <laughs> I would see them coming over the hill. Maybe they were stopping to say hi to friends or something, <laughs> whatever it was. I could get over there before and see that they had shown up and then verify here. So we know it's them. But, uh, uh, it really helped out that we have Robin Brum, we've got uh, all the others that have gone over there and they've spent the time to take video and photos and things to help us understand that we do have fledglings this year, D37, D38, and D39. Thanks, God. Support Eagles. And bring them home. Um, do, they, do you know that it's a dead tree? <laughs> Geico is going to be calling you soon and saying that you're not covered. <laughs> say. You don't want to get those out of warranty calls, you know. <laughs> it's calling about the extended warranty on your nest and yours, your tree is dead. I'm sorry. It doesn't apply. So the Decorah North Nest is where we we really migrated towards this year and, and uh, it was an amazing year. Um, it started out, uh, I remember, and, and remember that the core north, along with N2B, is a nest that, that we rebuilt. Um, I remember, you know, helping design, and, you know, Amy and Kike were up in the nest, and me and Rich, and others were down on the ground sending stuff up to them. But uh, that nest was recreated in 2018, and the Eagles loved it, and things have been going well ever since. Um, this year was a banner year. We had 2018, the new nest was built. You know, will they come? They came right away. And we think that that first eagle that showed up was DNF. Um, that took our trout that we left, their little trout presents. Nest cam set up in 2015 um, with three different families that are part of that, that property in the community. Black flies, you know, this is part of the history. It happened in 2019. It's in uh, Super Powered Eagles, Eagle Power, uh, DN9, you know, was part of that crew that uh, basically went into rehab at SOAR and then was uh, soft released down in mid Iowa. DN9 fell, recovered from rehab. That's just some history. 2020, 2021 seasons. You know, we're, we're pretty great. I think we we had a, we lost uh, DN11, was it? You know, the year before this this year, but we had a great flood and uh, DN11, DN12 was was it DN12? DN12 fledged. DN12 fledged and and gave us a great show after that for I, I remember quite some time. And then this year, 13 and 14. It's like, do we think that they're a male and a female? Is that what you guys are saying? Yeah. That's what I hear online, so sometimes you guys are the experts. Brother and sister are giving us quite the show, aren't they? So here's our eagles, Mr. North, very handsome guy. There's Deanna. She's got that fierce look. She says, I got what it takes. 
And she did, because I think this picture was taken at like 12 to 15 below. And they, they never ceased to give us comical moments. Here, Dad, here Mr. North came in, and he's, he's basically rearranging the nest and doing stuff while she's incubating the eggs. It's like, I don't even know that you're here, or I think you need a different hairdo, or feather do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress you up a little bit. So you can see the frost on her feathers. I mean, this is another one. You can see the frost, the little mini ice, micro ice crystals on their feathers. It was so cold out. And then Mr. North, he knows how to put a show on with the pheasant feathers, the turkey feathers. It's like, you know, hey, I'm ready to go out to dinner here. Looking pretty sharp. So this, this February and this March were just nothing short of amazing. We've had this happen one other year where uh, we had over a foot of snow and the eggs were laid. And they kept the eggs, and that center donut hole of the nest pretty much covered up by by being there. And then they get up and they shed the snow a couple times through the snowstorm with their wings, and then they'll rearrange the eggs a little bit and get back down. But to fit that almost three-foot body and get that brood patch down to incubate those eggs at that, you know, with that a foot or a foot plus of snow there is, is just crazy amazing. I mean, we've always wondered, are they going to make it? Are those eggs going to hatch? And I think each time we've had that kind of snowstorm, I can't remember the first year, but this year it was twice we had two of those, and both eggs hatch. So um, they do an amazing job. They're very well equipped and, and able to handle that. So we're learning that through experience. There's another movie coming out next year that we were working on video footage, and I'll just tell you, I can't tell you who it is or who's going to put it on, but this footage from the Cora North is, is on that, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing stuff. So, we're keeping the education going through movies, you know, across the world and across the country. They work great together. I mean, this is like, hey, it's your turn, it's your shift, you know, get over here. So, um, you know, right after that snowstorm, the second one, here's a, um, that looks like DNF, I think, uh, calling out Mr. North. And we're passing through the eggs and the hatching here, but uh, there's our little, uh, little fuzzy beauties there. And look at the transformation. Pretty amazing. Like I said, they have given us an incredible year of viewing and just uh, watching uh, in the absence of not having uh, uh, activity at M2B here at Hatchery. And this is just a, a couple days ago, I think. Uh, um, just uh, uh, tender moments of eagle siblings, I guess that's, that's what I'll say. We do research. Um, uh, we've got cam operators that are a network and they network together and they record every piece of food that comes up there. Um, it's just amazing. A uh, shout out to our cam operators, um, you know, uh, Smitha, Liz, uh, Dave who is here, Sandy who is here, uh, and others, uh, Mikey. Um, just, it's been an amazing year of just, uh, I, I used to do this myself and try to do most all the cam operating in the early years and I know that we would not be able to do anything like what we were doing right now if we didn't have all the volunteer help with the camera operators. They do a wonderful job. <laughs> so this shows uh, the Corn North Nest food prey feeding totals for 2020-2021 season. Um, we've got it breaking out by Mr. North, DNF, um, by prey, fish heads, pieces, feeding, self feedings uh, after uh, uh, the, the young started feeding themselves. So some very interesting statistics. We've got that to compare with other years. We've got some really interesting data that are presented between the North Nest and uh, the Decora Nest here at the hatchery. And you think that there'd be a huge difference because this is right next to the trout hatchery. But we found that there really wasn't that much difference in the number of fish 
and the number of meals that were brought up, they were very, very close. I remember presenting that last year and I was quite surprised how even things were between the two nets. Um, there's no cow getty down here at all. Uh, that, that's, uh, there's, there's cattle there and, and when they have a baby, the, the placenta and leftovers that are there, that's a food source that those eagles use. So that's what cow getty is. So here we got top, top food item is fish. Friday, right? Fish pieces, unidentified food objects, furry pelts and bones, raccoon, 20 fawn, uh, 20 cow getty, 11 rabbit, 9 muskrat. And I think I also had a few cell talks, which was kind of sad. I don't see it on here. Um, I'm sad. So. The core eagle. Let's talk to core eagles. Third year after the mate change with the M2, um, they did change nests. Uh, we think that they probably were working on M3 before 2020, uh, probably back as early as 2019. Um, and saw them fall over the hill towards the upper Iowa River quite a few times. And remember that season ended pretty early with the flies. Um, we lost track of uh, DM2, I think, early in, in the summer. We think probably out of the town. I was in the next part of the corridor. <laughs> I think he dragged mom over that way. We know that mom was here ever since she and dad the uh, here in 2007-2008. So she's been here, and you think about that, up to this year, 36 eaglets. Success catch N1, N2, and 100 tides. Um, so this new nest is. You know, the raised eaglets, these 37, 38, and 39. That's why I'm going to food and take it to them. I'm going to take it to them. I'm going to take it to when they're making that transition between fed by parents too, you're going to be on your own in a couple months and you're going to be taking that migration wherever too. So um, mom and DM2, we've been seeing them spend more time here. That's great. We hope that that's some kind of indication that, you know, they're going to like this area and come back. We'll see. No one knows. And that is the big question. Will they return back closer here, come back to M2? So amazing photos, I mean, that you guys have been getting. Uh, this is from the Millers. Uh, uh, they were here uh, for two weeks and just left a little bit ago, but beautiful shot of Mom Decor coming in and landing on the, the new maple tree. Here's just an amazing shot. Like, uh, that blackbird is like, I know you can't do anything to me. I'm faster than you, and I can do it. Look at me, I can do this just, just like you. It's almost like a perfect mimicking shot. But, uh, you know, they're around. Everyone has got to see. I know DM2 and Mom were on the maple tree uh, two days ago. Not yesterday, but the day before, early in the morning before I got here. So they are spending time here. It's still a great place to see eagles. It's still a great place to get photographs of eagles. And here's N3, and here's a shot of two of the eaglets. You can see it's a dead tree. We can see that it's a totally different tree shape, almost like a ice cream glass, you know, very steep angles. And they'd have to build up there quite a bit to get any more surface area. And it's a dead tree, so hopefully 
hopefully they follow that rule of uh, eagles don't like to nest in dead trees, right? You want that cover. Come back. So again, thanks to all uh, the photographers that have been getting shots and video or whatever of, of uh, mom and DM2 that we have been able to keep up with. Shift here, I'm just going to talk about a few of the other cameras that we've got. And I can't focus a lot of time on all of them, but this is one of my favorites, the Kestrel Cam. It's the Wisconsin Kestrels. It's a collaborative project with Cornell and with Neil Reddig Productions, Neil Reddig and Laura Johnson down at their farm. Um, it's interesting because uh, Kestrels are really good artists and their medium is the camera lens and what they do it with is their mutes, their poop shoot. And so they kept us busy cleaning that cam lens. We need to move that thing a little bit further away. It was a su successful year. As I mentioned, this is our partnership with Cornell, uh, Neil and Laura. Fourth year of the live cam. Last year we got cut short. Five beautiful eggs and then the female disappeared. We thought maybe a cooper sock had gotten her. Neil had said that there was a cooper sock that was hanging around. That happens in the raptor world. Male and female uh, uh, courted, laid five eggs. We had a great year. Um, five healthy young fledged, and I think it was all like within the same day. Um, uh, and I, I watched a couple of those fledged videos that Amy posted, and it was bare, the, the parents could barely even come into that nest box hole with any kind of prey, and they were just mobbed by those five young. It was just crazy to watch, crazy to look at. And those, those videos are still there. If you want to go up and see it. Here's just a shot of the two uh, uh, adults. There's a little uh, uh, perch there, and it's built right into the barn. It's uh, the holes there, and there's a full nest box in there. We've got a light tube that provides artificial light, perfectly timed with the sun, and earth rotation, and you know, natural light coming in there. And we've got a blower there and some other things that we have to actually, in the black fly years, the last couple of years, we've actually had to pump air through there and actually do some treating of the nest box with insecticide just to, just for them to actually live. So you know how bad those black flies can affect pestles too. There's just a shot of, of a female with the young, the five young. That's before they could really do damage with their open mouths and talons. And here's one of the feedings right before that I was mentioning, and the noise and the speed of the, the uh, vocalizations and dashing around, it's pretty incredible to watch. All right, let's go to falcon cams. And this year was an incredible year of learning for us. Um, we've never seen this on cam. Um, we got chances to talk to our falconer uh, uh, board members and others that we know just to try to understand what was going on. I mean, we, we thought we had ideas, but it's like, hey, we need to confirm this. This is really some interesting behavior that's going on. So here's Great Spirit Bluff. This is where I grew up, just north of La Crescent, Apple Blossom Scenic Drive, right on the mighty Mississippi River. It looks out over Lake on Alaska. This is where the nest box is that Bob uh, basically set up with my my dad and family, and that's how I got involved with the Raptor Resource Project. But a beautiful bluff along the Mississippi River. The uh, nest box is, uh, let's see if I can, nest box is about right in here, I believe. Cam is over here, and maybe the nest box is right there. Nest box is right there. Newman return, that was the first thing. I didn't get too fancy with all the the slides here, there was a lot of drama going on. Our, our female from the year before basically uh, uh, got into a pretty knock-down, drag-out fight with, uh, was it Nina? Uh, Nina yeah. and Nova. And uh, maybe something happened to uh, Nova. She was the one who prevailed. It looked like Nina left. Nova came back, at least for that day, and then we never saw her again. So. Uh, something may have happened to her during that fight, which looked pretty intense. A um, day or so later, a very young female, um, a second year female shows up, which is now Zoe. That was the name that we gave her, the new, new girl, right? 
And Newman obviously had to teach her the ropes, right? Uh, there's no ropes involved here. It's either cam arms or branches or trees or whatever. But um, as you know, it's just swiping tails across. It's not like, you know, it's pretty, pretty, it's PG, right? <laughs> now, the number of times they were doing it a day, I don't know about that, but um, whatever. Um, falcons are pretty prolific, just like other raptors, but hey, they were successful. Um, we were very excited that we got three eggs laid. The first egg was laid, and then almost two weeks came before number two came. But then right on schedule, two to three days after that, we got egg number three. There were some inconsistencies with what we normally see, with incubation starting at the third egg, that long delay between one, egg one and egg two. And then we also had a couple times where it looked like one of the eggs got kicked out and they were only incubating two eggs for a while. One of them was up, probably up, sitting behind the net, nest box uh, front board. Um, but they did make it back and they all must have gotten incubated. We saw them on three eggs and we had three hatch. So uh, it just shows the resilience of that developing egg and, and how it can it can survive some of those temperature changes and fluctuations like that. And delayed incubation can go that long before. I think once the incubation is started, it's a lot harder to have those delays um, with incubation once it gets started. But up until it's, that delayed incubation starts, there's, there's a little bit of window of time there. So our third IS here, there is Chance. We call it Chance. The raptor and chance, I think, because we saw so many things that happened or could have happened that were just going to get in the way of any falcon surviving this year. So we, as a new female, we confirmed this with our board member, Jim Robinson. They will shuffle, incessantly shuffle, almost to the point where they're, they're basically de-feathering their young. Um, and uh, so uh, we saw maybe some minor things that happened. Uh, it took a little bit longer for Chance to be able to stand, and some of that might have been just the, you know, getting light coordination and things after all the shuffling going on. Um, Amy and I did get down. The two that came before Chance did not make it, and uh, basically it was that time period where the, the innate behavior and the learned behavior con connected, and, you know, she finally figured out after uh, two did not make it that, she got the hang of it that these pieces of food, you know, need to be smaller, and she was able to get enough nourishment into that little bitty tiny beak. Um, I'll never forget the first time. Now looking back, it's kind of funny uh, that she laid a blackbird right in front of the newly hatched uh, young, and it's like, hey, here it is. <laughs> Come on, how come you're not eating? And you know, unfortunately, it took two uh, young, uh, beautifully young falcons. Uh, uh, and, and that, you know, that, that's the way it works. Got it figured out on the third one. Now look at Chance. This is showing her beautiful wings. She's just about ready to fledge. We think that's going to happen any day now. Amy and I did go down and treat her uh, at a little over a week old uh, for parasites. Hippoboscids, we used a, a insecticide that's uh, good for birds that we know works. We use it for black flies, and now we know it's good and effective for hippoboscids, too. This is what it looked like, I think, yesterday. That's what the Mississippi River looks like on these days with these temperature changes. Beautiful. Cloud Lake is what we call this. It's one of the beautiful times where you can't see I-90 below, and I-90 and is great to have, but it's nice not to see it once in a while. And there's Chance ready to take the skies any day now. Flyway cam. Flyway cam is just something that uh, um, that was. You know, let's get let's get away from man-made structures as much as we can, and let's get right out in the middle of nature. Let's set ourselves down there, and let's have an experience like you can't really have, you know, unless you have something that's not human out there recording it for you. So, Mississippi River Flyway Cam. It's our partnership with the National Wildlife and Fish Service out of Bryce Prairie. Uh, Bryce Prairie Conservation Association and Explore.org started moderated chat in 2019 and that's gone awesome. We got a lot of our mods here in the audience uh, today and have been here this week. 
a model for other organizations. Many have reached out and said, how are you guys doing this? Will you help us with this? Uh, Madison Audubon, we've been helping them and others, uh, just uh, doing a little bit of work helping out the National uh, Eagle Center with some of their cameras and things too. So it's great to be able to share that and, and help people see these beautiful creatures that we get to steward along and live side by side with. Uh, serves as a source of information and enjoyment for men. It's just a really cool shot near sunset. There's two eagles doing their tumble that everybody loves to see uh, in the air just uh, playing around. Egret, beautiful shots. Way too many species for me to show everything here, just some examples. Uh, everybody appears to get along, you know? Um, Tundra swans here, eagles, ducks, or geese. Here we got the pelicans. This is just recent. The pelican pods have come back. The pelicans are coming. It's one of the first ones coming back uh, uh, this time of year. We get to see them fishing. And it's just some more shots of a, a seagull and some eaglets. And the Sora. Yeah. This is a bird called a Sora, and it likes cattails and marshes. And um, it's the first time I've seen one. I had to reach out to my nephew, the ornithologist. Uh, maybe you might have known, but I just, uh, it's like, what is this? It's so cool looking. Um, I just saw that this week. So, moving on. Uh, Missouri turkey vultures. We got to bring back one of the cams that Bob started up, I believe it was in 2011, uh, 2012, with uh, Chuck and John uh, down in uh, Missouri, uh, in Marshall, Missouri. And they got a hold of Bob and said, we got turkey vultures in our barn. How'd you like to put a cam down here? We had a couple years where it worked out great. Then there was a family with uh, uh, some dogs and kids, and it just didn't work out. And uh, things changed, and it was back to, hey, we had a successful year last year. Let's get that cam going again. So this has been a really cool year to see the turkey vultures. I believe it's the only turkey vulture cam out there in the world right now. Um, and this might be the only one pretty much ever. But uh, we've got one of the adults sunning there, which is one of the coolest things to watch turkey vultures do, is spread their wings, and they got that bluish purplish cast to their wings. You can't see it here, but you can see the glowing sun on the back in the shadow. Here's the two young now. The watchers call them little bits. They're not so little anymore. Um, they're going to be losing their down, and now you can see they're stretching out those wings, and they're, they're getting ready to, to fledge here sometime in the next couple weeks. Very good and monitoring. We had a banner year. This was an awesome year. Um, very rewarding in many ways. One, we didn't have to wear masks all the time. <laughs> it was much more enjoyable that way in the heat. Um, we banded 80 falcons, and there's probably about another 8 or 10 that were too old for us to even try on cliff sites. Um, if they're old enough that they look like we could possibly push them off, um, we won't take a chance. And I know Harper's Ferry or Leo's Bluff was one. Uh, I think uh, Mawson's Bluff, south of Nelson, Twin Bluffs, Wisconsin was one. So there's a number of them that we couldn't get to. So we could have been close to pushing 90, and that would have been, I think, a record. Uh, so we're finding some more nest sites, uh, natural ones, and um, our, our monitoring and banding program is strong as it's ever been. Here, uh, um, this, uh, I guess, Effigy Mounds last year was just an a, a amazing moment where, where Bob and uh, John Dingley and Dave Kester and the group that raised the Peregrine Falcons and left him here and then released them over a two-year period at FG Mounds off of Hanging Rock. Uh, that monumental uh, event where they basically helped the falcon figure out and remember where it came from. Most of them were going towards square shop, square shaped nest boxes on bluffs or other buildings and they were not going back to the natural iries and potholes and they figured it was nest site imprinting, and they were correct. And two years after they did that release, they started showing up Lansing, uh, uh, Queens Bluff, and, and uh, uh, Maiden Rock. The Mawson's, I believe, were some of the first ones. Maybe Castle Rock was, too. So just some amazing research that was done, and, and that work that Bob and the Raptor Resource Project did, that's what made 
this banding for the last two years so special. So 29 site visit, this is a shot from last year. This is that uh, we were banding uh, Bob and, and Maggie, um, named after Bob and Maggie Jones. Um, and it was just monumental. It was, it was one of those experiences that you never forget. And here's some of our uh, falcons at Redbird Bluff. So let's talk a little bit about D37. D35, D36. You guys heard out. Anyone who came to the telemetry uh, demonstration today got to learn that, if you didn't know already, that D35 was found dead and that she died because of lead poisoning. You know that the females are more susceptible to lead poisoning than the male eagles are. So I guess, unfortunately, that, that makes sense. There's number six shot, probably you know some BB shot from small game or bird hunting. D27 is currently right around here, you know, upper Iowa River, just a little bit west of town. Sometimes she's been hanging just a little bit south of town here. Uh, so she's still around. She's probably got a white head now. She's probably just about getting ready to find a mate and maybe set out on territory one of these days. D36, we know that he's been hanging out uh, up towards Camp, uh, uh, Harmony, Preston and Chatfield, Chatfield area. High water, we know it's the root river. So here's D35 and D36, uh, right here at the hatchery, the year that they were dispersing. They look like they're all ready to go, standing straight up and just for the camera. I think they were hams. Here's that shot uh, showing where D27 has been hanging out. Cora, Upper Iowa River, Trout Creek. Here's that shot that Amy put together, which is really cool. It kind of shows how much an eagle can really see when they're up in the, in, in the sky. So they, it's totally different, the perspective that they see when they're in the air. So how do they navigate and find these rivers and valleys and, and, and find prey and find other eagles, it's easy. They've got the eyesight to do it, and they've got the height to do it. So here is just a simulation of Chatfield, and here's the Cora, and you can easily see how they could follow that riverine system and make their way back down to the Cora. Classroom. Um, the pandemic hit. We had just put out our virtual education program. Um, our teacher group, a bunch of them are here. We got some of our teacher education group folks here right now, right? Yep. Lori and Meg is here, I think. Right? And Deb. Any others? Um, but anyway, thanks for what you do. Uh, we got some cool content that people are using in the classroom, and one of our, one of the things that we are working on right now with with Jeff Worrell, our new uh, employee, uh, is to get this material out to the classrooms and really help teachers and, and others realize and know that this material is there for them. So we might be having a conference to uh, bring some of those teachers in and teach them and show them how to use that. But that's that's in the works right now. You can see we've got the, we've got the educational chat. Um, back uh, last time we counted, uh, we had about 1,500 classrooms that have logged in and asked for access to the resources. So we know that folks are seeing this without us really trying too hard. So if we start getting the word out that this stuff is for, out there for you guys, we really think that this could really take off more than it has already. Guest moderators, these kids come in. They know so much about eagles. They probably know more than so in some areas than, than I could answer. Um, this is our core mission, is really connecting kids and, and people with nature through bald eagles, through peregrine falcons, through the flyway, through uh, you know, restoration efforts and conservation efforts. Just some examples of some of the stuff that they produce. Math, weight, other core and STEM subjects that they work on. Here's some 
shots of uh, that in action. And here's some mantle, uh, Gloria, some of the verb, verb uh, demonstrations of showing their verbs. Mantle and soar. I've been in the classroom when they do this stuff and it's just precious. <laughs> it's precious to see kids learning this way and doing this stuff. And then talking to the families about it afterwards. It really is a kind of learning that um, is more efficient and effective a lot of times than reading stuff out of a book. Okay, our banding station. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, but we did have two banding stations. Um, we saw lots of species. We have uh, stipends that we do with Luther College, um, and we were hand in hand with them. We're on Luther property up on Hawk Hill, and we set up two blinds, one on Hawk Hill and one over at the Reddick Farm this last year. And we, we, the students got lots of experience. We masked up, we had filtration units and things to protect through COVID, pro COVID protocol. We made it through that successfully, so um, it was a very successful year. Uh, Dave Kester will probably be here later if you want to talk to him about any of that program. It's, a, it's an amazing program. It was funded for two years by an IDNR REIT grant, and we've, we loved it. We've been running it every year based on contributions from all, you all and others that, uh, that help support us. It's such an important program. Just some examples. Here's Sophia Landis, who also claims and, and bands falcons with us and does monitoring as a perfect example of bringing new uh, researchers and new people up through the ranks. Sophia started out in the banding station and um, now she's helping us out on, on, on multiple fronts. So bringing in, training in the new guard, right? There's an example of Dave Kester and Emily Neal here right in the Decorah schools training and teaching some of the kids. They got a curriculum that they get pre-approved in advance by the school district and they come into different grades and do a program. And those birds that they're catching up on Hawk Hill, they'll let the teachers know and then they'll come down and do the release and do a, a program outside with the kids. We have the Robert Anderson Memorial Scholar Scholarship Rams program and that's going strong. It's self-funding now. Thank you so much for all your donations. Anyone can still make donations to that. Right now we're funding a $1,500 scholarship annually to a student at, at Luther College right now that's in an environmental science or biology coursework program. And you know we've done that, this is our third year now that we've offered that. And the, the funding is, is uh, just the returns on the money through the Community Foundation of Northeast Iowa. They're the ones who manage that fund for us. It's self-sustaining now. And someday we'll add to it. Maybe we can sponsor two students. Philippine Eagle, we're making progress there. We might be working on a monumental program to help them draw in some funding resources and some, some uh, uh, famous people, some entertainers and others to help with the Philippine Eagle effort to help this most endangered eagle in the world and help uh, educate the Philippine Folks just like Cornell and like Neil Reddick and Laura Johnson and others have already been doing. It's a successful program with Bird of Prey and some of the other programs that have been shown over there. Um, they'd like, we'd like to try to help them with that reading program and take that to the next level. Just a shot of that and you can go to Amazon and you can rent uh, Bird of Prey for 15 bucks anytime you want and watch that amazing movie. What's coming for 2022? Nest cam prep maintenance, September, November. We look forward to that every year. We get to invite our good friend TK Arnold back in from San Francisco and help us out. We got new eco location in Decora. You know, we need to have that backup cam, and we can't trust uh, that they're going to nest an N2B. So we probably will be finding another eagle nest here close by. We've got some good prospects and camming up another nest here uh, this fall, just so we do have a backup nest, just in case something happened at the Corps North, which was our main Eagle Cam for our education program this year. We brought back the Eagle Valley Flyway Cam, so this coming fall with the migration should be pretty amazing to see that. We got the Flyway Cam in Lake Alaska. We'll see some differences between those two, uh, but we're really excited to see another one that we can watch what's going on 
on the mighty Mississippi. And then we got the Golden Eagle Monitoring Program that we've approved. We saw Jeff Worrell earlier today talking about Golden Eagles and how they come down to this part and they winter down here. Um, we're really excited to uh, get going with that program. So that's, that's a pretty exciting thing. Just some of the noteworthy Raptor films. You guys know these. You know, the ones that Bob and Neil did. Then we got Iowa Public Television talks about Bob and the transition, you know, when, after Bob passed away. Decoding the Driftless, Secret Life of Owls, Bird of Prey, and then recently Eagle Power with PBS Nova. I can put that back up if you want to get. And this is this is being recorded online too. So thank you so much. We're coming up to the end here. Thanks to all of our moderators. Let's just give everybody a hand here. We got our <laughs> moderators, our teachers that are here, and some of our cam operators are here, and some can't be here. Cam operators in Florida, Ohio, you know wherever in the country they do it all electronically. Or they do it here from the shed. Or from my basement. Um, the agencies, all of our partners, we could not do that without them. And you know, we're always doing the best that we can to do a good show as a good example. So uh, anytime there's an opportunity to do this kind of stuff that landowners will be welcoming to do this kind of education and outreach. Our videographers, they make it very easy for Amy and I, especially Amy with her nest flicks and everything, the roundups that she does. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. There's a lot of work and a lot of effort that goes into getting that stuff out there, and it's a pretty lean crew uh, that uh, we've got here, so all that, that effort is, is pretty amazing. I'm going to break into John's speech, which he'll tell you I feel free to do anytime I care to, and uh, offer a thanks to John. I think, you know, John works his butt off. Uh, Susan's been really supportive of it. This is not an easy job, and he's done a really good job. Bob made an excellent choice. He took us from where we were, and that was a good place, but he took us to someplace even better. So, it's here for John. Thank you, it really is fun most all the time. Sometimes when you get in the business part, it's like, hey, I need an MBA to do this stuff. <laughs> I can, but I'd rather be doing other things. Um, we mentioned teachers already. Um, and probably, you know, a very significant effort, you know, of the full funding and what we do comes through Annenberg Foundation, Charlie Annenberg and the Explorer Group. I just want to special thanks, uh, say spe special thanks to them for helping us out with our CAM operator, uh, just uh, assistance and volunteers and, and the funding that they give us each year it really means a lot and it helps us uh, to do what we want to do and go further. So that's all I've got. we got a little bit of time for questions. Uh, our eaglets, as always. Uh, um, can, I, can I come up for just a moment? Yeah. Do a special thing. Amy would like to mention so, her. Thank you. So I already thank John. I just want to take a moment to thank our moderators, the Decor Eagles. I know that was a tough year because we didn't really have that. The Decor North moderators did an amazing job. The Flyway, you guys are awesome. So I really want to thank you because you do so much engagement, so much for us. So thank you. And I didn't mention you, but you guys are always out there doing the hard work, letting people know what's going on, answering questions. So I don't think any of you are here, but also just so you know, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I was mentioning uh, Annenberg and Explore.org. Uh, um, as far as other organizations that we work closely with, um, we partner with CAMS, uh, especially Falcon monitoring that Bob set up relationships for a long time ago with a lot of milling companies up and down the river, um, like in La Crosse area, uh, U.S. Bank, and other others like that. We've got a bank down in Peoria, Illinois, uh, uh, that we we ban falcons at the top of that. We've got a nest box. Um, we've got a great relationship, and 
Early on, I mentioned May's Internest with uh, Excel Energy. Um, we work with them hand in hand with their their bird cam program, and uh, they're a significant uh, help to us in keeping Amy and I busy. Uh, they keep us busy, and uh, um, we love working with them. And I think you know that that special camera out there, probably that first Eagle Cam out at Fort St. Brain. It's been challenging over the years, but the last two years we've had some great exposure there with Excel Energy out at that location, and that's that's a special one, and a bunch of the Falcon sites here too, uh, up and down the Mississippi River. So thank you to Excel Energy for partnering with us. Any questions that folks have? Go ahead. So the question was, I noticed that there's two different bands on the Falcons. One of them is through uh, um, the uh, bird banding lab, and that's the actual U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service band. Uh, that's the official band, the ID of that bird. That we, we got a male and a female band uh, for that silver band. And then we've also got a color band that we use for identification. It's meant to be easily ideable as best as we can with a small band that size. Um, and it's got a number and a letter on it and colors. So that, that one's to help us with spotting scopes or cameras or whatever to ID the bird. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, what about the strategy of uh, let's build a nest and uh, come to it? That's something that I've definitely thought about. Uh, we've got a couple locations here where there are nests that used to be in some nice big trees or there's some trees that look like they would be great nests next to a, another nest area. Um, we know the build it and they will come works here. Um, uh, it's a possibility. I was actually thinking about the possibility when we do our work here of remember mom starting, or actually that young male starting a nest uh, with mom kind of just watching on two summers ago. Um, I think it might be worth starting just a, a partial nest in N1 as a you know, I've, we've been thinking about that. Um, it's a good idea. Um, the cameras are there already. It would be a, a minimal effort if we're going up there to clean to put a few branches up there and get something started. So we, we probably will talk about it and we might do that. Um, but yeah, a great idea. I thought about that um, at a couple of the other potential nest locations that we're looking at. With N2B here already and with N1, uh, we're thinking, you know, we. I don't know that we're going to try to do something else here. We're, we're really hoping that just some of the disturbances over the last couple of years here, you know, may have uh, uh, been some of the reasons that they may have chosen another location. And hopefully, you know, as things have settled down around here, our man-made influences and stuff like that, you know, at this next location, they might come back to NTD. We had some construction going on last year. Um, you know, uh, there's there's things that happen. There's traffic that goes by here with trucks that are hauling gravel and things like that. Just you know, in the city of Decorah area, things that we, we really don't have any control over. And we notice it. We see some of the eagles' reactions. You know, it's like, hey, I wonder. You know, is that affecting their choices? We really have no way to know. But uh, so there's things like that. Uh, maybe we're not putting out enough fish for them. I don't know. You know I'm going to have to talk to Brian and see if we can uh, put, it, put more fish out, right? Anything we can do. If you guys got any great ideas, feel free to let us know, and we're always going to consider. Okay? Right, right. Murphy's Law, yeah. And just so you guys know, I mean, here's... Here's kind of how it started. Here's a $750 PTZ analog camera, and here's a $20 homemade, uh, it's either, it was either a bubble juice container or a piece of plastic um, with foam in it. And, you know, Bob was good at doing a lot with, with uh, not a whole lot of cost resources. He was very thrifty. These things worked great in their day. Um, when we put cameras, a couple, multiple cameras up in a nest these days, um, 
not even talking about hiring climbers and us, the work that we do and staying in hotels and things like that. Uh, putting three cameras up in a nest easily is about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars these days to bring the the high D HD resolution cameras to you guys. So um, our budget is over three hundred thousand dollars a year. So just the free will donations that folks like you have been making, and I work with, on contract with Excel Energy and Grant from Explore Annenberg. Um, those are the things that keep us going and bequests too. I have to say that over the last three, four years, we've received some significant bequests, you know, between fifty to hundred thousand dollars a piece, coming from folks who decided to include the Raptor Resource Project in their will and their end of life planning and giving. So um, that's huge for us. You know, it's always an option. We're probably going to be letting people know more and more that it makes a difference, and we love it when people can do that if they want to do that. Um, that helps us. So anyway. Here's some some unique uh, mementos. These we got more like this, but these are the ones that came from the Missouri Turkey Vulture site when I got to redo that one um, this year in April, I think. So, good question. Other question, Pauline? Yeah, I have a question about the fray at uh, DNN. I noticed this year it seems more than ever, more frequently. They would, the adults would bring in tons of food, <laughs> one at a time, you know, like six trips in with just a morsel. Uh -huh. And I just... Yeah, that's interesting. I, and I noticed when taking a look at the statistics, it was actually mentioned parts of birds, wow. animals, or whatever. Now, we know that they will bring in like a turkey foot, a turkey wing, or breast or parts of animals like that. So I don't is that what you're talking about? Or more smaller pieces. Or even smaller, like yeah. Fish. yeah, yeah. So maybe they're gorging themselves first and then bringing some of the, the remainders back just to make sure that they're taking care of themselves first. Um, that's I I don't know that I've heard of much of eagle caching like falcons do. So I can't say that I know that that's something but my first first uh, guess is that maybe they're taking care of themselves first before bringing it to the nest. Was it earlier in the year or later in the year? That makes sense because you see what those young will do going after them. Anytime they see a parent with food, it's like they are on them. And they can actually get pretty, they're very aggressive. So that might be because they're taking care of themselves and, and doing that before exposing themselves to the flagellants. I think we're pretty much done. We've got dinner coming up at 5, and I don't know where we are right now. 4.30. 4.30? Okay. So we're going to take some stuff down and get uh, prepped. It feels like it's cooling down, which is nice. Thank you very much.